on camera. Today is Thursday, September the 26th, 2019, and we're here at the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. My name is Frank Luton, and I'm a veteran and a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And with me also is Sue Verhoff, who is the Director of Oral History and Genealogy here at the Atlanta History Center. We're here today to record the oral history of Mr. Greg Studdard, who served in the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. Mr. Studdard's oral history is being recorded for the Atlanta History Center's Veteran History Project in partnership with the Library of Congress. We're very honored to have you with us today, Mr. Studdard, and many thanks for participating in this project. So to get us started, state your full name and date of birth. I'm uh, Gregory Neal Studdard. I was born March 7, 1946 in what used to be Crawford Long Hospital here in Atlanta. My mom said it was nine months to the day after the war ended. Okay. I'm actually pretty correct about that. So, so why don't we start by just telling us about um, your growing up years, where did you grow up, and, and the family that you were with when you grew up. Tell us all about that background. I grew up here in Atlanta on a small farm that our grandfather had, uh, Henry Allen Studdard. Uh, the three direct male ancestors of mine were all combat veterans. So my grandfather was in World War I in France in the trenches. And my dad, Wesley, was a naval aviator in the Pacific War II. And of course, I was rifle to me in Vietnam. Here's a picture of Wesley. I just picked up a few things on the way out the door. Okay, there's Wesley. So I um, wound up on my grandfather's farm because my dad got back fine from the Pacific and the war and became a commercial airline pilot for Southern Airlines. And unfortunately, it was in an air crash when I was two years old, so I never really knew him. And I was raised by his brothers and sisters. He had six siblings, and his grandparents, and his grandmother, my great-grandmother, all lived next door to me to help my mom out. So it was, all in all, considering everything, a pretty good situation to grow up here. And then, when I was 12, my mom married a retired, not a retired, an active-duty Army officer, Red Muir, who all he did was move between Heidelberg, Germany, Atlanta, Georgia, three times in Heidelberg. So on his third tour, we went over there and I was in high school in Heidelberg for three years. He's been a great dad. I was just with him for five days. I go down to Florida visit him. He's 92 in assisted living and I was down where he is now trying to get him rehabbed with a broken leg. That's what I've been doing the last few days. Okay. Tell us about your experiences when you lived over in Heidelberg. I loved it. It was a very big change because I came from a uh, totally segregated school here in Georgia, they all were, it was Atlanta Public School, to a, a military high school and that was completely integrated. And I remember the first month I was there I had a wrestling class, a PE class, and the coach said, okay, I want two of you, you named me and this other kid, to come up and demonstrate a Navy ride which requires you to put in your arm over the guy's back and hold his arms, that kind of thing. And he was a black kid. And um, he whispered in my ear, nobody heard this, he whispered in my ear, he said, you're from Georgia, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. He said, it'll be all right. So he just wanted to put me at ease. So it was a good experience over there because these kids have been all over the world. I hadn't. I'd just been in Georgia. That was it. So it was a transformative experience for me. And I later went over and studied at the University of Frankfurt and worked in Munich for a while, too. So I've gone back and forth over the years. Okay. And a after high school, uh, did you have any brothers and sisters? I have a half-sister who was born over there, Jennifer. We have the same mother but different fathers. And she's wonderful. I saw her down on this trip. She lives down near my dad with her husband. She was born in the hospital in Heidelberg where George Patton died, not the same year, but pretty close to it. She was born in 62. He died in, I think it was 45, right there in Heidelberg. So it had some history to it. And she and I have kind of shared the caregiving with um, our parents to make sure they're taken care of over the years. And we, we haven't argued about anything that I can think of, which probably sets us apart from a lot of families. I used to be a, a probate attorney, so I've seen 
plenty of families fighting about the different things. Okay. And uh, after you graduated from high school, what happened? Well, I uh, went to Emory. Nobody in my family had gone there before, but it seemed like a pretty good place. I'd visited it and um, really enjoyed it. I uh, was in a fraternity, ATO, which I, I still see some of my pals from back then. Uh, it was a good liberal arts education. My stepfather thought it was a little bit too liberal. He called it, what did he call it, the People's Republic of Memory, indoctrinating me. He's pretty conservative. <clears throat> so I graduated there in 68. Oh, part of my time there, I was uh, half, my senior year was in Washington on exchange program. So I lived there, studied there, and then I had a six month trip to Europe and studied at the University of Frankfurt during the time. So I was back and forth. I graduated in 68. Uh, the country was pretty well torn apart back then. Uh, with the Vietnam situation, and there wasn't a, a lottery. I didn't have a deferment. You had to have, you know, be a medical school or something. You're just going. So I knew that, and um, I volunteered about a week before my draft letter came, so I could have some choices. So I got into Army Infantry OCS, Officer Candidate School down in Fort Benning, and had about a six month delay before they had my slot come up. So I, that summer, I drove a bus for the city of Atlanta, the old Atlanta transit system. Went in at 4 o'clock in the morning. It filled in for guys that called in late. And then I took some courses at Georgia State. And on January 9th, I was in basic training at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And my dad told me, of course, he'd, my stepfather told me he'd been around the Army a lot. He said, well, there's one thing you got to remember when you go up there. He said, whatever you do, don't let the first sergeant get to know your name because that means you're a screw up. Just keep a low profile. Those two months will pass. You don't stop the clock. Just don't get hurt. And it was a it was an opening, brought eye opening experience. I'd never met anyone who couldn't read or write until then. There was a young man named Cliff, who was in my training company, who was from Maine, and I think he had a lot of native intelligence. Pretty smart guy. But his parents had pulled him out of school to work on the potato farm, and I think they just never sent him back. Which was probably very illegal. So he couldn't read or write, and I, I think the Army got him a GED. They're pretty good about educating people. But Cliff had this girlfriend who wrote him letters, and he couldn't read them, so we had to read them to him. But the girlfriend liked to very explicitly explain what she liked to be doing when he got home. And then we had to write the letters back because he couldn't write. And I'd, I'd do that sometimes. He'd say, well, tell her this and that. I said, Cliff, you can't put that in a letter. Somebody might find this. Her mother might find it. He said, if you don't put it in, I'll find somebody else who will. <laughs> So there we were. <clears throat> You're laughing, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> so this was at this was at, at when you were at Fort Benning. No, I was at Fort Dix for basic training. Fort Dix in basic training. Right. Well, how was how was that? It was miserable. It was January and February. That wind was whipping out of the Atlantic across those cranberry bogs, and you know the the, the fun part about it was the people. I like that, but. The military took some getting used to, you know. They had one way of doing it. As my dad said, you just can't fight that. They're going to do it. You can make it harder yourself or not, but they're going to do what they want to do. <clears throat> and then I went from there out to uh, the Ozarks, to Fort Leonard Wood, where they thought I needed to become a combat engineer. So they taught us how to use explosives and build bridges and things like that. And I thought that was great. It was nice weather, springtime. And then um, went down to Fort Benning. Had two weeks leave, Fort Benning. And I was there for six months in OCS. And I thought that would never end. Um, it was hot, summertime and early fall. But um, it was good, I think, looking back on it. It's a good experience. I still see some of my friends from there. I was commissioned down there. Um, and they kept me down as an instructor at the infantry school. So I taught heavy mortars and Ford observers down there. And then got orders to Vietnam and went over. So that's pretty much my, my military schedule. And and where was your family during while you were down in Fort Benning? Did they live here in Atlanta? Here in Atlanta, that's right. Okay. I'd gotten married in that two week leave. Then they locked us in the barracks for six months, which was an ideal way to start out a marriage. I remember the only time you could be near your wife or your girlfriend was at chapel. You could, they'd march us over there, 
but you could go in and sit next to them, okay? So I was sitting there next to my then wife. I have another wife now, happily married, but we were sitting there, and the chaplain had started his sermon, and we heard this noise upstairs in the balcony. And we could tell what they were doing. There was a candidate up there with his girlfriend making noise, and they shouldn't be doing that. So the chaplain turned to his sister, assistant and sent him up there to stop that. <laughs> They're distracting the troops downstairs. <laughs> That's what you get when you lock these people up for six months. They should have expected something like that, right? Didn't you go out on leave or anything during no, those six no, months? No, no, no. We, if we were lucky, we got a, a Saturday off. We couldn't leave the post. If you did, everybody could recognize you because they had very short hair. So you weren't going to get very far. I remember, they inspected our hair every Monday morning at a formation. The tactical officer in charge of my platoon was really a funny guy, Barney Barnett from Red Oak, Iowa. So he was going down the line one Monday morning, and he said, this kid next to me, he said, did you get a haircut over the weekend? You're supposed to get one every week. And the guy looked like he'd a machete. Barbie used a machete. looked awful. looked like ground beef. His head did. And he said, yes, sir, I did. And, and Lieutenant Barnett said, I got news for you. That's not a haircut. That's an industrial accident. <laughs> So it was. <clears throat> so you remember they were trying to figure out how the Vietnam War could be resolved. When I was in there, they were arguing about the shape of the uh, conference table in Paris, the peace talks. And of course, I had another year down at Benning. You'd think that'd be enough time for them to get it resolved, but it wasn't. So when I was sent over there, they had 350,000, 360,000 troops in Vietnam, a lot of people. I think they were trying to figure out how to wind it down, but they had not. So I went, and everybody in my OCS class went, too. What were your feelings when you were on the way to Vietnam? Talk about that. Well, I knew it would be very dangerous, as we had a lot of training, uh, booby traps and landmines and things like that. But it was a real thing. It's different. And when you're trying to lead 44 troopers, it's a lot different. And some of these fellows have never been away from home. They were 18, 19 year olds. Good guys, but <clears throat> it's like being a mother hen. And I went out on patrols, I think it was 12, 13 days at a time, and back in for three. That's pretty much what we did. We were up in the north in I Corps, south of Chulai. It was busy. Um, you had to keep an eye on these fellows because they would could get themselves in trouble. They would do things like uh, they were supposed to carry Claymore mines, which had some explosives in them, but never carry blasting caps in the same pack. So I'd have to go around and check that, and invariably some kid would be carrying them together. And if he stepped on a booby trap, everything would just go up, him and two or three people in front of him, behind him. There's a lot of explosives there. And they all had hand grenades. They had uh, high-velocity rifles. So. They thought it was fun. I, I, was, I was scared somebody killed kill themselves out there with that because I would be the one that would be in charge of explaining it to their mama. And the lieutenant uh, writes the letter home. So what, what was your, were you, were you in charge of the guys? I or? was. I was a rifle platoon leader. Okay. What, t talk about being a rifle platoon leader in, well, in Vietnam. That's the only officer in that group, that platoon. And usually have, you hope you have an experienced sergeant. And the rest of them are pretty much new in country. They don't come in together, they're replaced as they rotate out or they're wounded or whatever. So some of them had more experience than others. Um, it's just like any other group of 18, 19 year old young men. You get, you get some that do a good job and some are just like to cut corners and do things like that. The one thing I noticed is that um, we didn't have the drug problems there that they did in the rear areas because the, our troops did have access to drugs, marijuana and heroin, things like that. but. If they were using it, especially at night when you're supposed to be alert or on guard, um, the other guys with them would just beat the snot out of them if they caught them using drugs. I didn't have to worry about that. I woke up one morning, this guy looked like he'd been in a razor fight. And I said, what happened to him? He said, well, we caught him smoking marijuana when he was supposed to be on guard duty. We always had three up, usually in a triangular formation, three up on each, one at each point. And that ended that. So 
in many ways, it was harder being an officer in the rear area because you had to deal with all those problems. And I never had that problem to deal with. I had other things, but not that. I realized early on over there that um, winning that war had uh, sort of a movable definition. And I really didn't think that the American public was getting the truth about what was going on. I, I know looking back on it, if you read the Pentagon Papers, they did exaggerate the body counts, things like that. And I tried not to be bitter or have a bad attitude about it, but you got to do something to hold your head together in a situation like that. You just go crazy. So I figured the only way I could keep it together was to get as many of those guys back alive and unmaimed back to their families. And that, that's what I tried to do. Uh, I didn't want to make a career out of it. We had to be, you know, very careful. I had to do some things offensively to stay safe, but um, I didn't go out and seek firefights and things like that. It, it didn't. It was not an adventure to me like it was for some guys. So how often, how how long were you in Vietnam? I was there for nine months. They let me come out early because I had been accepted to law school at Emory. And if your school started up to three months, it let you out early. Started at a time we needed to start it, or have to wait another year to start it. So it was on a September to September cycle. Of course, there were guys over there looking through school catalogs to find things that would only start once a year, and they didn't know when it started. And hopefully, get out. And on the plane coming back, a lot of those guys were in training with me and in, in, in Benning, so we knew each other. We just hadn't seen each other for quite a while. And it was a charter flight. The uh, stewardesses were the toughest, serious, most serious stewardess you ever see because they'd had episodes with GIs and stewardess, you know. <clears throat> but nothing happened on our plane. I think we were pretty well behaved. Talk about some experiences that you may have had that when you look back on you say, I was lucky, or, or that was a scary experience, or where do you begin? <laughs> well, talk about that. Tell oh, us about uh, that. Uh, well, most of our things happened at night, either booby traps or ambushes and things like that. We didn't get much action during the day. Well, the first time we had anything happening near the day, I'd only been in country about two weeks, and we were walking across a dike and a rice paddy about this high above the water. And there was a tree line three or 400 feet on either side of us. As we walked across the rice paddy, my RTO radio, radio telephone operator, who always walked right behind me, grabs me with the straps of my pack and pulls me and throws me down in the, in the rice paddy, which is typically fertilized by water buffalo. It wasn't a nice experience. I thought he was crazy. I started yelling. He said, wait, wait, wait. You're being shot at by a sniper. He said, look in that tree line. There are little puffs of white smoke over there, and you could see the pings in the water. So we called in some helicopters, and we had some machine guns with us. Kind of scared them off. We were okay. I never got hit. I was never actually wounded over there. So I'm very grateful for that, although, you know, people with me were. The other episode that sticks in my mind, it was months after I'd been there. Well, I guess there are two more. I'll talk more at a time. Uh, there was a river, the Song River, they call it the Song Bay. Bay means river. That was a demarcation line between where we normally operated and where the NVA staged their troops. We were pretty near the Ho Chi Minh Trail, so they could bring all their equipment and rations down and everything, and they would stage things near us. We knew they were there. So before I got there, the uh, operations people in the battalion had some uh, personnel movement detectors that were dropped in by helicopters. They were battery powered, and they lasted, I don't know, a few months, maybe a year. And they were dropped in on that river edge so that they could detect the movement over there. Of course, that did not require people actually placing them there. But when the batteries were worn out, you had to send somebody in. Instead of dropping new ones, you had to go replace the batteries. <clears throat> so I was sitting there on our side of the Song Bay, and they brought a, a new, lieutenant, new lieutenant to come in and take over my platoon because I was the company executive officer. I had the radio, the battalion, to all the platoons and everything. So I was sitting there and saying, oh, well, it's not going to be good. So they're walking down that strip of land and monkey grass, which can be head high, it's pretty thick. And all of a sudden we heard this explosion, this big black column of smoke, and they'd hit a 155 uh, 
artillery shell that's booby trapped. And those things are about this long, about like this, a lot of metal in those. And um, three of the guys were killed. They'd been in my platoon when I had it. And we got some helicopters in to medevac them out. They called them dust offs. So the wounded KIAs were taken out immediately. But they wouldn't take any of the survivors out. We had to go in and walk them out of there. So uh, that was my job as being the only officer around because the new lieutenant had been injured. So I got some volunteers together. I thought that'd be a good way to do it. And uh, we were waiting across this river. I guess it was two or 300 feet wide. And the water was up to here. So we were our rifles up above it. Perfect targets, everybody saw us. Got across OK. And then as you look around, you see some things that will tell you that this is not a normal situation. The, the uh, people that set booby traps or landmines over there would do things like put an old combat boot upside down on a stick or tie three knots of grass together, and you look for those things. And having been in the Boy Scouts, I was pretty comfortable outdoors, and I looked at these things, and everywhere we walked over there, there were these things. So you're kind of trying to wind your way between there, and I got over there, and the fellows that had survived were in kind of a state of shock, and I said, well, let's get out of here. Don't bunch up. We don't want the same thing to happen again. So we got out okay, thank goodness. Uh, I went up to see one of the guys that lived for three or four days in the hospital. And uh, his leg had been blown off, so he was in bad shape. And, uh, it just breaks my heart to see that happen to anybody, young people, just beginning their lives. It's tough. But as I say, I was not wounded. I guess I was meant to come back and be interviewed by you. OK. You mentioned you were in the Boy Scouts. What else did the, did that experience and did that play any role in in some of the things that you could do or couldn't do or or helped out or that's an interesting. Well, one. I think so. Um, a lot of the scout leaders, this back in the fifties, were World War II veterans, and several of them friends of my dad. They'd all grown up together. Of course, he was deceased by then, so they kind of took care of me, and we did a lot of camping. Uh, they had a week-long summer camp at Bird Adams, which back then was up here at Vinings. It's not there now, but it's at Vinings. And I think my mom got me in the Cub Scouts as soon as she could because she knew that would be a good influence, not having a dad at, at home. I, I think it was, too. I, I later became a scout leader. I, I think I spent 26 years either as a Cub Scout, a Boy Scout, an Explorer, Scout Leader. I was a Girl Scout Leader, from triplets. Half the troop was ours, so I had to do something, right? And it's a good program. So when you came back, you came back to Emory Law School. I did. Talk about were you, what, what did what did you talk about your experiences there? Uh, did people ask you questions? Talk about how that all played out. Well, they did. I knew some of the fellows already because they were in college with me, and they were a little bit ahead of me, so I'd see them there. And a few of us were veterans, not too many, a few of us. I remember the first week of class that we had this professor, Bill Ferguson, was known to be really gruff. He was a good teacher, good instructor, but he was very gruff and liked to torment the students. And they were, these guys in my class were whining about how mean he was. And I said, well, let's keep this perspective. Five weeks ago, I was in a place where half the country was trying to kill me. So I've got a warm place to sleep at night. I sleep the same place. I have food. You know, it could be a lot worse. Just take it easy. I don't have much sympathy be whining about Bill Ferguson. <clears throat> Okay. Now, were you married at this time? I was. I was, yes. Okay. T talk about when did you get married, and was that before Vietnam or after Vietnam or during Vietnam? It was before. Uh, Gloria and I were married in that two-week leave I had right before OCS. She and I were in college together. So uh, she went down to Benning with me and worked down there. Army wives usually worked off post doing something. And then she worked... Uh, while I was in law school. And then she went to law school later, right after I finished, she started herself. We didn't have any children at that time. I've got plenty of those now, as you can tell, but that was a second marriage. Okay. I think it's harder on the family that has to stay behind, not knowing what's happened day to day. Because you remember they had all these newsreels on TV, and that was the first war that was really covered intensely by television. And they had to see that if they were watching the news on all the news. Whereas I knew where I was, where I was going, what was happening at that very minute, they didn't. And I'm sure the wives 
and the family that stayed home always feared having a a green army vehicle drive up and a chaplain and an officer get out because you know what that's going to be they got to tell you that you lost somebody over there. I never had that duty, thank goodness. Did you encounter any demonstrators <laughs> on your way back and while you were at Embry? On the way over. On the way over. I met a friend who was a Navy officer and he was going to Vietnam too. We met in San Francisco at a nice restaurant for a meal before we were both going out the next day. And we always traveled in uniform, so I had mine on, he had his on. As we were coming out of the restaurant, some guy with a, I call it a John the Baptist haircut, walks up to me and spits on me in my uniform. So I start swinging at him, taking him down to the ground. And my friend Mike said, you don't need to be doing this because they're going to arrest you both and you're in uniform. So I got up and he ran off. But you wouldn't see that in the South, I don't think. This is a very different environment here. Uh, there's probably a lot more respect for the military, a lot more people had been in it. There are a lot of Army and Navy installations all throughout the South, so it's just a different environment than being out on the West Coast. I didn't expect that to happen the day before I left Vietnam, though. Okay. Any other experiences when you came back and at, at Emory and law school and all of that? Well, I did not stay in the reserve, so I wasn't around a lot of military people then. I don't recall any protests. Things were beginning to wind down. I graduated in 74, so and out of law school, and things were pretty much over then. Um, we had some conversations, people in my class would ask about it, but more of the kind of questions you're asking, not trying to um, embarrass me or start a fight or something like that, which is good. My wife used to tease me, my present, present wife, she said, well, you Irish boys, there are only three things you do really well. I said, what's that, dear? She said, drink, fight, and make babies. I said, well, that covers it, doesn't it? <laughs> what else really matters? <laughs> How much can I say about these things, too? <laughs> I don't know, I might have to edit some of this. Okay. I notice you have a, a resolution from the State Bar of Georgia about military service and veterans. What was that about? Well, I knew I was going to be retiring sooner or later, so I, I did that about six months ago. But 19 years ago, Kerry King and I, you know Kerry, started a free legal clinic at the VA hospital. It was the first one in the country at a VA hospital. And we've had, I think, as many as 24 volunteer lawyers, all free. And there was another guy out there with us who was in World War II, Mac McClendon. He was an older retired lawyer. He and all five of the McClendon brothers had gone to World War II. They all got back. They're all in combat. This is before the Sullivan Rule, where you couldn't go in where your siblings were. One of them had been KIA'd. And Mac uh, was a waste gunner on a bomber, and he bailed out over it over Germany. He's a POW. He was really a very interesting guy. But his wife said, you need to find something else to do after you retire. So we went out there and helped to start this legal clinic, which was great. We had uh, volunteers helping us do things. Um, two of my favorites, Bill and Betty, he's still out there. He's 95 years old. He was a Marine on the first wave on Iwo Jima, right off the boats. He saw the flag go up in Suribachi. So there are a lot of people around there. A lot of the veterans we, we talked with had some interesting experiences. So... I kept doing that. I did some other things, usually with the theme of helping veterans. I've been on a, a regional advisory, it's the Mental Health Advisory Council of the VA, focused on, in large, trying to find good mental health care for veterans, because there are a lot of suicides, as you know, in the veteran community. And we saw the results of some of that, that out there they've had people that just jumped off the parking lot. They put up fences there. There was a guy that was in the mental ward. He was a veteran up there, and he got out, and they didn't find him right away. He had killed himself in a closet on another floor. So I thought, this is just kind of outrageous that's going on. And what really was the worst one, I think, was this dad, who's a farmer, really a nice guy, a salt earth guy, came in with bib overalls, he almost in tears, and he said his son had called him a couple of months ago, he was a Vietnam veteran, the son, in his 30s, 
And he said, Dad, I think I'm going to shoot myself. I'm depressed. He said, I'll get in the car. I'll take you to the VA. So father and son go out there in the middle of the night, and they wouldn't admit him. They said, we can give you an appointment in two weeks. That's as soon as we can see you. So the next day, the kid shot himself. You know, we had to, and the father was very distraught, and he said, well, what can I do about this? So I said, well, call the IG up in Washington. They came down. They did a big investigation down there, tried to straighten some things out. And um, just tell everybody that there's, there is care available. And we'll, we'll work on that on our end. So we got something started called Project Open Door, where if anybody came any time, night or day, to the ER anywhere in the VA, they didn't have to prove they were a veteran. They didn't have to be in the VA system. If they were about to harm themselves, they had to admit them. Of course, it was voluntary. If they wanted to get admitted, they could stay there and get at least the beginning of some help. So it's not perfect. Uh, all of this is voluntary. You can't lock someone up because they have suicidal thoughts. That's, it's all voluntary. But it's a lot better now than it used to be with the military. Thank goodness. So this, this thing, I just brought this with me. The State Bar gives an award called the Marshall Tuttle Award every year for a lawyer that's done things for veterans. And I got one one year. Carrie King got one, too. And I'm not going to put you through reading all of that, but a lot of it had to do with that, uh, that clinic there and some other things, that suicide prevention and things like that. Uh, it, Marshall Tuttle Award is named for a Vietnam veteran that was killed, who's from Georgia. Marshall is his name, and Tuttle is Judge Elbert Tuttle, who was on the old Fifth Circuit, and wrote a lot of opinions that gave military right to counsel if they were charged with various things. So he, and he was a military officer, too. Great guy. There's a book written about him, which uh, is really worth re reading. I remember one episode from it, if you bear with me, it's a short story. He was a young infantry officer, like I was, in the reserves. And there was a guy that was arrested down in some little Georgia county, charged of raping a white woman. He was black. And the jail was surrounded by a lynch mob. So. The sheriff calls the governor up and you got to send somebody out here. So the governor sends the troops out and Elbert Tuttle was in charge of a young officer. So they go out there and as they were going out, the, the sheriff was heading about out the back door. He didn't want to be around any of that. He said, you can have it, it's yours. There must have been 200 people out there armed with weapons at night, torches, all that stuff. I'm sure the, the defendant inside, he must have been scared to death. So judge, later to be judge, Lieutenant Tuttle, grabs a machine gun from one of his troopers and walks up to the front of the prison. He said, um, I've got this armed. He said, if anybody steps one foot toward me, I'm not going to take you all out, but I can take the first five or ten down. You ready to start? And they all went away. They just dispersed. I don't know what happened to that defendant, but at least he got a trial, I think, which is more than a lot of the black defendants were getting back then. So he did his job. I forget where this started. What, what led me to talk about this story? <laughs> it's a long way to get there. Oh, the, the, the uh, chart. We, we still do that. We, we award that not every year, but most years to someone that <laughs> has usually spent a lot of years helping veterans one way or the other, all, all lawyers. Talk about your law career after you graduated from Emory. Well, the, the sexy thing to do is to be a litigator, which is what I did. I started a mid-sized firm. And the two partners that found it were both red legs, artillery from World War II, so they knew each other. And I guess they liked to hire veterans. I suppose so. We had a lot of them around there. We didn't have any women or any black attorneys. It, this is way back in 74. We changed that while I was there, but it was pretty old, old style. So I did trial work. Um, my first trial that I had, nobody from the firm went down with me. It was on the trial counter, and I told them, partner in charge said, well, this is on trial and I said, go down there and let me know how you come out. So <laughs> I went down there and uh, the judge, it was a civil court of Fulton County, which had a small case. They weren't going to let me have one. I could do a lot of damage. The judge was Horace Ward, a black judge who had been denied admission to the University of Georgia. He was black. They said, we'll pay for you to go to another law school. He said, no, I'm going to do that. We're going to sue you. That's what he did. So he got a law degree somewhere else and came back and became a federal judge later, a very good federal judge. 
So I went in to his chambers and I said, Judge, can I talk with you with my opposing counsel in the first day of the trial? I said, I've never done this before. And he said, well, Mr. Studdard, uh, here's how it'll work. Uh, if you need to stand up and make a motion, I'll say, do we have a motion from you, Mr. Studdard? And if you don't know what motion it is, I'll say, do you have a motion for summary judgment? <laughs> and just say something and we'll take care of that. He said, you'll get a nice clean trial. I won't let you get embarrassed in front of your client or your law firm. And I'm sure your opponent won't let that happen either. He was a good guy. He'd been out eight or nine years. So he'd seen that happen before. Everybody remembers their first trial. So it lasted three days, a pretty long trial for that. And, and I didn't get a verdict, but I, I didn't get humiliated either. And I went to Judge Ward's funeral. I told that. They had, you know, people remembering things. And I said, you know, he, he had this young tadpole of a lawyer that knew what I needed right there, which is to get out without being embarrassed or being sorry that I was a trial lawyer. Wasn't that great? So I did that for, I guess, eight or nine years and got kind of tired of doing trial work. I remember one, one day somebody stole all my exhibits out of my car right before a federal trial. And back then, you had to bring your own overhead projector, no electronic stuff in your exhibit. My client had another set in his office. We went back and got those. But I said, I, and I'm tired of doing this. So I, I started my own office out in Buckhead and did some litigation and some non-litigation, some corporate work. And then I went in-house with the Federal Reserve Bank. I was senior counsel there. We had six lawyers. Three of us were all in the same law school class then, right? So I stayed there for, I guess, five or six years and liked it, but I was getting a little bit anxious to move on. So then I became general counsel at Bank South, which was a bank here in Atlanta, and stayed there three years. I was the only general counsel that ever had the first, last, and only, because it was bought by Nations Bank. <laughs> so when Nations Bank comes snooping around to buy them, I, I knew it was going to happen. I thought, well, what am I going to do? And that was providentially solved because my wife got pregnant with triplets. And I said, okay. She was 47 when she had them. Okay. Here's a picture. They're a little bit older in this one. Oh, look at they that. Adopted, I can see that. Yeah, hold it back by your chin. There you the go. Dang it. They adopted our son, Henry. There he is. And then seven years later, we had triplets. And uh, you know, my wife, she said, well, now God what, has a sense of humor, doesn't she? <laughs> That's what she said. What, what year were the triplets born? 95. Okay. And because of them, I decided to get completely out of trial work because my wife's an Emory physician. When we had a sick child or a teacher conference, she couldn't, you know, change her patients. They were booked four or five months in advance sometimes. So I did uh, elder law for 24 years because we had a, a lot of trust business at Bank South and estates and things like that. And, of course, older people have estate problems. So I did that, and I loved it. It was great. But that, well, I did go to court. I, I litigated in probate court some, but that's way different than other courts. I was down on the Grange one time, my opponent down there said, well, I want to help you out. I'm going to tell you something that's really going to help you. You're ready to start the probate trial. He said, uh, you know, that judge doesn't have any legal training, which you don't have to have to be a probate judge in Georgia. He had nothing. And he said, I'm going to tell you something else. His main job is not this, but he's a televangelist. He's got a cable television program down here. He said, do not say anything critical of Christianity or any religion or anything like that. Just watch it. You'd be on his bad side. So I said, thank you. And he was doing me a favor. And that trial moved like greased lightning. He, he didn't know any evidence, didn't know any procedures. He just let everything in, let it go. It was, it was a quick trial. So how is your family today? They're thriving. They're thriving. My talk wife's still working. Talk about your family today. Well, my wife is on the only job she's ever had. She's a pediatric dermatologist at Emory at the clinic. And she's at Grady Hospital one afternoon a week. She's in the clinic a couple of other days. She's actually out at the VA uh, the hospital Friday afternoon. They may wonder what a pediatrician is doing out there because they don't treat children well. She does follow up on skin cancer surgery for the, the vets and really enjoys it. This is the only job she's ever had. I met her and we were married after she went to medical school in Wisconsin and undergrad there and a residency in Cincinnati in pediatrics and another residency in uh, Oregon. So she'd done all that training before I met her, which was good because I didn't have to 
go through all that. My dad, my stepfather calls for school the People's Republic of Madison. <laughs> People's Republic of Emory. <laughs> well, how are the triplets? They're great. They're 24 years old. Uh, one's a second year Duke law student, so I'm very proud of that, that she followed the old man's footsteps, sort of. Uh, one is about to finish at Georgia State. She's a studio art major, very visual. A couple of months ago, she went through my closet and pulled out all the shirts that I'm no longer allowed to wear and put them on my bed. She said, you can't go out in public with these things. And for heaven's sakes, don't tell people where you got those shoes. <laughs> you see that? I said, why not? She said, nobody buys their shoes at the Chevron station. <laughs> okay, I think they look pretty good. They look, I like them. Good. They have them there if you want a pair. I don't know if they have your size. <laughs> and the other one just um, transferred from Reinhardt University up in North Georgia. It's a small school. And she's taking a little bit of time off. I think she may transfer to Georgia State, but she wants to be a social worker or a school probation officer. God help her. You know, that's good. Toughen up for that. So all very different personalities, all three of them. Hmm. They're all healthy, which is wonderful. You know, I think that's the thing that you worry the most about, about you know, your older parent, you're pregnant, having a healthy child. So we were very blessed. You know what Martin Luther King said about a newborn child? He said, a new baby is the latest good news from heaven. And the good news is we were all born without prejudice and hate when we come into this world. That's something to think about, isn't it? It has to be learned. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to teach it to you. Right. Right. And your son? My son, Henry. He's uh, 31. He's a great young man. He's a baker at uh, San Francisco Coffee. He's up at 5 every morning. He enjoys that. He, college is not quite ready for Henry, but he's worked hard to get to where he is now. So I'm very proud of him. You say, is he in San Francisco? San Francisco Coffee Company here in Atlanta. It's a oh, okay. small okay. three-location place here. Yeah. All right. Henry's a funny kid. I remember we were at church one day. We just finished communion. We are both kneeling there in the in the pew. And Henry looks up at me. I said, what are you doing, Dad? And I said, well, I'm saying a little prayer. He said, for what? Well, actually, Henry, I'm saying a prayer for more patience with you. <laughs> and you know what he said? He said, keep on praying, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, as you now look back upon your law career, how, how did that experience in the Army in Vietnam, how did that, did that help you, hurt you? How do you think, what do you think about all that? I definitely think it helped me. Uh, just three more years of maturity before law school helps anybody. Be more serious about things. Um, in the military, you see all kinds of folks. They had uh, what they called McNamara's 100,000 where they lowered the mental standards, so they, they were short on troops, so we got a lot of those. And you just have to Take people from where they are and try to move forward. It's practicing law. You don't go in critical of them and just hope you can make things better. And with the uh, elder law work and the state work I did, there's always opportunities to head off family disputes. Um, I remember one of my friends in law school, Henry Bowden, his dad, Henry Bowden Sr., was a well-known trusted estate lawyer, and he wrote a book about some of his experiences. And uh, he said, the first case he had, he would take anything that came in the door. This guy comes in, he said, uh, I need a lawyer. I said, well, why do you need a lawyer? Well, because I'm charged with stealing a bicycle and three Dominecker chickens. And Mr. Bowden said, well, before I take your case, I need to find out, you need to tell me the truth. Did you steal those things? And the guy said, well, You've done touched on the most difficult part of my case. <laughs> <laughs> so the Army helped me to take people from where they are and see if you can move them forward, which is good for anybody. And it's good for raising children, too. My wife is more experienced with the child rearing because she'd seen a lot of very sick kids with her work. Mm -hmm. She realized early on there was only so many changes you can make in any child. There's an imprinted personality. And if you're butting your head against the wall, that doesn't help anybody. 
And the same is true in the Army, I think. Okay, so is there anything else, as you now look back on your life, that you'd like to share with, 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 at, for this interview? Well, I feel very fortunate. Uh, I had some unusual experiences. I lived in Europe for three years with my stepfather. Uh, Army was an eye-opening experience. I know my mom was worried because my dad had died a very violent death in that plane crash. I know it just made her sick to have me over there, but I got back fine from there. And um, I, I've enjoyed lawyering. I enjoy being out at the clinic. I still go out there once a month, sometimes more often than wanted to be a hospital. And that's kept me in touch with a lot of veterans that are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, some World War II guys too. Like Bill and Betty, Bill's 95 years old, a Marine in Iwo Jima. He's still volunteering out there. Every time I go out, he's there. Mm. He and Betty were witnesses for my wills for many years. And one day I said, uh, Bill, we need to find us a younger couple of witnesses here. <laughs> you mean I, I live some of these wills? Okay, all right. I'm good. Okay. She had a law degree. She went to Westminster and had mm. a law degree. Great, great couple. It shows you the quality of people they have out there helping other veterans. That's the whole thing with this, to get these guys through some tough times. Uh, we're not seeing retired admirals and generals out there. They're just regular guys that, you know, get in trouble with child support or mouth off to a police officer, things you and I wouldn't do. I don't think you'd do that, no. And then they, you know, have trouble, and they can't afford a lawyer. That's the bottom line. They need a lawyer, but they can't afford it, so we help them out. We do... Uh, wills for terminal patients up in the wards, surgical wards. I went up, uh, a social worker called me and said this gentleman, he's probably about 60, had a kidney transplant, was being rejected, he wasn't going to live one day or two, he doesn't have a will, okay. So I go up and I talk with him, he had four daughters and he was telling me he wanted to leave everything to one daughter and I said, well that's a surefire recipe for having a fight, is that what you want to do? And he said, well, she donated the kidney. And she's been over here seeing me almost every day since I've been in the hospital. The others have not been around at all. I said, okay, I think we can make a pretty good case for that. And he passed on about three days after that. But he seemed very relieved that he got that will done. It made me feel good, too, that he crossed that off the list. So that's, that's about all I need to say. Thank you for a great interview. Well, thank you. You got any questions? Can I ask just a couple sure, questions? Sure, fire away. We always kind of like to ask, what was your first impression when the aircraft doors opened onto Vietnam, when you first got there? Do you recall what you were thinking? Well, it smells different over there. Other people probably told you that because they, they burn the human waste, so that was the first thing you remember. Uh, I just hoped I'd be coming back within a year. We, none of us knew. There's the same airfield where you landed, that's where they're flying out the casket. So it was a sobering sight to get off the plane. I felt that I'd trained well and just make the best of it. I felt I'd get back. I mean, you had to feel that. Okay. You described a couple of really interesting experiences, a sniper attack and then the incident with the, the motion detectors along the river. Right. You mentioned there was a third thing that kind of stood out in your mind. I thought I'd give you an opportunity to try to recollect that. Well, yes, I remember one thing. Yeah. Um, it was Easter Sunday, 1971, and I was in the rear area. Sometimes they'd rotate the senior lieutenant back there to do paperwork, so I was there for a couple of weeks. And one of the jobs that that second lieutenant had was to unload the body bags off the helicopters, which you know I hated. And then you had to identify them. An officer had to vouch for who was in that thing. So you had to find somebody that knew them. And if they were your guys, you, you'd get that job. So um, the battalion chaplain, Merle Brown from Butler, PA, who was a major, great guy, was flying in on a helicopter to do Easter Sunday services at a fire base. And just before they landed, his helicopter was shot down by RPGs, rocket patel grenades. And the whole crew was killed, including Chaplain Brown. 
So they sent some of our guys in there to get them out, and it was a firefight and everything like that, but they got the bodies out. And I was there at the battalion aid station when they flew the helicopter in, and we knew there were some KIAs coming in. I knew that it was Chaplain Brown. And fortunately, somebody else stepped forward to identify him. I guess I would have had to do that, but it just broke my heart that this guy didn't make it back. He was just a superior person. And that's just one story out of many. It, this war business is a big waste. And I probably feel differently about it than some of my Vietnam veteran buddies, and we've talked about that before. Um, I personally feel that we should not have gotten involved in a land war in Asia. It's really hard to win those. When I saw how determined the Viet Cong and NVA were, and they would have stayed there to the last man died. It's kind of like the Japanese in World War II. They didn't give up. And then we had these things at home which didn't make it easier politically, it made it impossible politically to keep going. So I think they were trying to extract us with some kind of honor, but they didn't find a way to do that. You know, we had what McNamara and Johnson were trying to build things up. And I heard McNamara speak at the uh, Jimmy Carter Library one time, he was on a book tour, and he said that he knew in that war that we weren't going to win. He, he was sorry they didn't get pulled out early. One of, one of the guys next to me said, why, why didn't you do it? He didn't ask me, they asked to me. And I don't know the answer to that. These are tough questions. Um, I do hope that we don't get involved in something like that again. I, I hope we've learned, but who knows? People said that we learned in other wars and we just seem to go back at it. We have to do some of these. I'm not saying we can avoid all that. We have to do some of that. And we have to have young men stand up and do it. It's a young man's project. You can't get older guys to do it. They're too realistic, I guess. <laughs> they don't want to get out there. <laughs> they, the young guys think it won't happen to me. I've been reading A Farewell to Arms by Hemingway, and it, the best book to come out of World War I. And it's a wonderful book. He was an ambulance driver, the, he, the narrator. I think it might be autobiographical. The narrator was an ambulance driver for the Italians, World War I. And as it develops on and on, you can see it's getting more and more anti-war because they're sending one of these guys all messed up. They didn't have very good care for them back then, hardly any. And you read that and you wonder why we even do this stuff. And I guess the answer is that it gets done to us and we can't just sit there and take it, right? So here we are until we figure out a better way. Thank you. Thank you. And Appreciate thank you. Your time. Thank you for your service. I enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you for telling me that. <laughs> and we appreciate you coming in. I'm glad to. Thank you for thank your you. service and welcome home. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.